So, okay, so if we lived in the jungle, uh, what Greg told us about was really reassuring. Nothing's going to go wrong. Okay, how many of you have a cell phone? How many of you would love to live without it forever? Okay, so, okay, it's just not very clear. There's a few of you who would agree with me. It's uh, irrelevant, uh, the cell phone. But how many, have, how about GPS? You kind of like it, you use it. How many of you have used GPS? Okay, so if you didn't have GPS, how would you like that? No, okay, you're part of this modern day technology, uh, you know, world that we live in. It's worse than that. Uh, our GPS system, our, all of our satellite systems, uh, nighttime up or daytime pictures of weather patterns, weather forecasting, uh, all of that is kind of based on this technology that we kind of have created. And it's dependent on that 0.1% of the solar irradiance that Greg indicated doesn't really affect our climate. But all of this technical world that we live in depends upon that 0.1% and its variability. And that's my task in the next two lectures, if you like, to sort of reassure you that we really do care about that 0.1%. Uh, thanks, Greg. Okay, so let's start. Um, can you all understand my accent? No? Okay, uh, then we're stuck. Uh, okay, I'll try not to speak too fast, but uh, let's just wait until we get this thing started. I see a couple of you have brought this up. What I'm talking in, I've modified this from the one, so when it goes awry and you're looking at something that's not the same as you're seeing on the screen, the one on the screen is the current one. I messed with it over the last few days. Uh, okay, so clearly uh, I'm going to break into two parts. The first one is about the local uh, processes uh, at a location, if you like, in the upper atmosphere. And then the second is try to put it together as a system level problem. And even uh, with our uh, system level problems, we have the same problems that Greg talked about trying to build. Uh, kind of one parameter representation of the whole atmosphere climate. So uh, that's kind of where we're headed. Uh, I've got to say a few things here. Uh, the materials, I I've stolen them liberally from the textbooks and from other authors. So to some extent, Dana gave an excellent start to uh, this on Friday. Now, you all have short-term memories, so I'm going to test them a little bit by repeating some of what you heard on Friday about the ionosphere. Uh, so uh, I'm expecting some audience participation. OK. Do you understand what that means? OK, good. So let's go. Uh, the take so here's what I'd like to think happens by the time we're finished uh, this first lecture. The takeaway message from this uh, talk would be the appreciation of how important a narrow layer in the ionosphere is for various heliophysics processes. And uh, in a short, this is kind of what you are looking for during the talk. This layer that we're going to talk about has various names. I'm going to introduce SAIR, but we'll define it later once you've seen uh, what we're targeting. Uh, for ionospheric people, it's often called the E layer. Uh, from an atmospheric point of view, the turbo pause is pretty much there too. And uh, from a magnetospheric point of view, uh, it's where the Pedersen and Hall conductivities lie. So these are all kind of in the same place. And the altitude range is 100 to 120 kilometers. So as we go forward and you see altitude profiles, kind of look to see what's going on at 100 to 120 kilometers. And it'll cover ionospheric effects, atmospheric effects, and even magnetospheric effects as we go forward. OK. Oh. Uh, how many of you are solar people? How many of you ever did a calculation for Pedersen conductivity? How many of you knew there's, thank you, sir. How many of you knew there was Pedersen conductivity? How many of you know why Pedersen conductivity is important to the sun? No, okay. Guys, we haven't done our job right. <laughs> okay, but I'm not going to tell you. Uh, you'll be inquisitive and you want to find out if it's relevant or not. OK, so let's begin. The neutral atmosphere, any ionosphere is going to be in a neutral atmosphere. So for a few uh, minutes, we'll show a few slides about neutral atmospheres from an ionospheric person's perspective. Uh, all 
ionospheres exist in an atmosphere. That's fairly maybe obvious. The uh, thermosphere ionosphere forms the neutral to plasma interface between planets with atmospheres and space. And, and that's coming back to this idea of uh, this region we're going to talk about. The composition of the ionosphere is governed by the atmosphere itself, the chemistry that goes on, and the nature of the ionizing radiation. And uh, Dana did a pretty good job on that, too, giving you a first time through. The atmospheric dynamics influences the ionosphere. And that's, uh, especially during these solar minimum periods, we learn more and more about this particular term, Gra gravity waves, uh, tides, and things. Uh, apart from photons, what other forms of ionizing radiation are there? Question. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Electron impact ionization. And of course, that's going to be associated with? Cosmic uh, rays are small, but yes, that's true. Oh, OK, Jupiter's magnetosphere, and uh, of course, things like aurora even there. Yes? Anything else? Pardon? Solar. Oh, OK, so uh, uh, the uh, high energy component, SEP, and other things. Yes, they do. Right, uh, so we've high energy particles. We've all talked about electrons, but ions also uh, affect it. And if you energize uh, ions and they do charge exchange, you suddenly get very energetic neutrals. And they uh, aren't governed by the magnetic field, and they can also produce uh, ionization. So although we're talking primarily about photons uh, for this talk, there's other things. So very quickly, you've seen a plot like this. Uh, this is our terrestrial uh, thermosphere. And the composition uh, from, 100, oops, from 120 kilometers upwards which is where the main ionospheric layer lies, is a combination of nitrogen molecules and oxygen molecules. But the rare earth, uh, helium and argon are there too, although argon's not on this plot. And of course, as you go higher up, uh, hydrogen becomes important. And this outlier is a really important uh, thing, the oxygen, atomic oxygen. In a laboratory sense and down in our environment, creating atomic oxygen is really hard. And yet up there, it's the dominant neutral into the upper atmosphere. So a space station and other uh, objects that are up there are satellites. Engineering to avoid atomic oxygen cor corrosion is a real important uh, other side effect of that being up there. OK. So here's a question uh, that I'll answer and I'll ask others later. But the sun's solar cycle, uh, we heard that uh, with respect to the atmosphere and atmospheric climate, that's not a big deal. But look, uh, here's what we get uh, in the thermosphere. This is the neutral gas temperature. Uh, the NRL emsis is what we're just using. So it's an empirical uh, model with some physics in it. But this is our altitude range, uh, up to 450 kilometers from 50, and the temperature, uh, our neutral temperature. Noise somewhere beneath this things are sort of constant. I've got four curves on here. And the cryptically, we've got max and min represent the solar cycle. Winter and summer represent our seasons. And mid midnight and noon represent sunlight dark. So the, this is the dynamic range, if you like, the extreme range of our atmospheric temperature in the thermosphere. And the strongest modulation from here to here uh, is the solar cycle. So the solar cycle, in terms of our environment for our heliophysics, uh, really is important. The solar cycle does affect it. Notice 120 kilometers, 120, the, the region we're looking at. Beneath it, it's fairly constant. And of course, you will point out to me, wow, look at this. There's a big change. This is an atmospheric dynamic effect. It's not a solar cycle per se. It's a winter-summer effect of large-scale circulation in the mesosphere. But uh, above that is where the solar cycle is effective. What does that do to the neutral density that we're going to build our ionosphere from? Well, here's the modulation. Again, uh, low down here, there's not a strong effect in neutral. Uh, this is only N2, the nitrogen molecules. But uh, they're in a kind of diffusive, uh, they're a diffusive kind of uh, hydrostatic kind of problem, as we heard from Dana. But again, the range uh, of uh, values. This is logarithmic, two orders of magnitude of density. 
up here. So this is well over an order of magnitude between solar uh, min, solar max, uh, and our seasons. So there is a strong modulator uh, for the solar cycle in our ionosphere. Uh, again, up effectively above this uh, level. OK, uh, this is another way of looking at what Dana told you. Uh, below about 100, uh, this is a very turbulent mixed regime. And this straight vertical line at 1 represents the ratio of argon uh, to uh, the uh, molecular nitrogen. So it's a relative plot. But all the way up from the ground up, this ratio is constant. But the minute you hit this region again, the uh, uh, the mixing breaks down, and the species go into their own uh, hydrostatic equilibrium, which then, of course, depends on temperature and their masses. And that's why uh, Dana showed them separating out nicely higher up. But this is just empirical evidence uh, that what we're saying, this region really does uh, have this kind of problem. The mesosphere is well mixed, and above it, it's not. And words like turbopause start to appear to describe this region. Uh, OK, uh, the other one of the other neat things in our system is the following. Uh, the atomic oxygen is produced in this environment. Uh, the uh, kind of ways in which it's produced, there's three lines here representing three different uh, simulations. And I've hidden, because it's not too relevant, the eddy diffusion, and uh, there's a couple of other free parameters that modelers have. Because the physics, literally, in, in this region, uh, with the, tur the turbulence breaks down and it goes away, if you like, uh, isn't too well appreciated. But by changing it by factors of two, we actually can uh, get changes in what kind of oxygen uh, densities we get as we go higher up into our region of interest. But again, the entire process. Uh, below about 100, 120 kilometers uh, is minimal. And above it uh, is kind of our significant O plus generator, if you like. OK, uh, since we, uh, you may have noticed that it was uh, uh, terrestrial ionospheres plural. And we tend to have a habit of using uh, Venus and Mars as a terrestrial type of uh, atmosphere, ionospheres. So if we're going to do ionospheres for these two, we have to look at their uh, atmospheres too. So again, uh, very quickly, we'll just show you uh, figures that you've seen before. Uh, number density versus altitude and the different species. The big difference is uh, CO2. Uh, I'll bring up Ven uh, Venus as well. And you can see, again, CO2 is the dominant uh, lower atmosphere neutral gas. And uh, as Dana indicated, uh, these um, molecules rattle around a little bit. You put energy in. And apart from words like ionizing, uh, you can have rotational bands excited, vibrational bands excited. Uh, so these uh, become uh, extremely good radiators uh, of energy in the infrared. So uh, when you get a large uh, you know, component of CO2 at high altitudes, the infrared escapes uh, back out into space. So I don't know if you recall, but uh, when Dana showed the temperature uh, for these two uh, uh, planets at very high altitudes, the exospheric or the temperature of the neutral gas was very cold. And to some extent, uh, it's to do with the abundance of CO2. In the Earth's atmosphere, of course, we don't have CO2 as the dominant. Uh, it's still more mole molecular nitrogen in these regions. But as we uh, go through a climate evolution and we put more CO2, methane, water to higher altitudes, they'll have a cooling effect on this part, of these altitudes uh, of our system. OK, a lot of CO2, and then a different chemistry produces O plus. Uh, the O, sorry, just an atomic oxygen. OK, so now let's go to ionospheres. Uh, so it exists in a neutral gas. The relative plasma to neutral density is variable. For terrestrial planets, it's less than 1%. Dana pointed this out to us, too, that in uh, these gases around uh, the planets, the plasma component is less than 1%. And we're dealing with less than 1% of the solar uh, constant energy. And yet, our technical world entirely depends on 
how this works. Okay, uh, the daytime is dominated by solar uh, EUV soft X-ray to create the ionization that generates our plasma. The nighttime, we talked about this uh, on Friday, uh, there is scattered sunlight, starlight, cosmic ray, these kind of contribute in different ways, but that generates a stable E region that doesn't completely disappear. Auroral charged particles from the magnetosphere produce ionization, hence plasma. And it's uh, an auroral oval, and we'll talk more about that later uh, in the second talk. And the ionosphere is electrically coupled to the magnetosphere by providing electro electrical conductivity channels. So here's my quick question, based on the training I'm doing to you. If you had to guess, at what altitudes are these conductivity channels located? Someone brave enough to guess? Yes, ma'am. 150 is a little high, but uh, bring you back down to the region we want, 100 to 120. All of this physics you're going to find uh, is kind of anchored uh, down in this one layer. It's only two or three neutral scale heights thick. Uh, and yet that's kind of where, uh, for our system, it comes together. OK, so here is um, a quick plot of uh, a typical uh, ionosphere, uh, a terrestrial one. Uh, there's three kind of regions of interest to us. Uh, the first one is where molecular ions are rich. The molecular ions uh, don't hang, a hang around very long. The recombination rates are very fast. So the time constant for these is kind of minutes uh, or seconds even in some cases. The uh, production is direct uh, sunlight onto these. Uh, there's photoelectrons produced, which produce secondary ionizations and everything. But down here, uh, the region of interest that we're talking about is a molecular ion region. As you go higher up, uh, the O plus uh, ion is the dominant ion, and it forms, uh, how many of you can see a chin, a nose, and a forehead? Okay. Where does the brain lie? Where does the brain lie? The brain lies up in the magnetosphere, I hate to say. <laughs> OK, so, we're, we're, so this is what you have to remember. Here's your nose. And uh, I have a question for you. In what way does the ionosphere corrupt GPS geolocation accuracy? How, how many of you are slightly familiar with the technology? Does someone want to, sir? Okay, so that to zeroth order, he's correct. There's, there's typically two uh, frequencies transmitted, and they have different propagation characteristics. Uh, and the, the more uh, electrons we put in the path, it's a refractive index to all intents and purposes. So the two uh, are, but that itself uh, isn't the big problem. The big problem is as we do space weather, and we have storm, sir, go ahead. Right, so there's a second order effect. Uh, sorry, I'm calling it a second order. The, the, this plasma can be disrupted uh, and, and form irregularities and waves. But they, that's, in my mind, second order. The big problem is when uh, we have geomagnetic storms, it's highly structured. You have an auroral oval and other things. So what actually happens is this uh, shape, if you like, isn't consistent in latitude and longitude. You get very strong gradients. And the triangulation codes the GPS has to use using multiple satellites, any one pair, you can correct with maybe three frequencies a lot of this. But when you have gradients across latitude or longitude, the GPS uh, starts to give you uncertainties or not uniquenesses in the geolocation. OK, uh, this plot. I just throw in because uh, the processes that are going on are very fundamental. Uh, down here, uh, I'm looking at O plus. This would be, a, a, it's an electron density associated with O plus. Uh, the altitude range puts this above our region of interest. So we're not talking about the moleculars. This is primarily O plus. But almost all of our uh, 
physics-based models involve three processes. At low altitudes where production and loss uh, are competing and the time constants are fast, there's not time for diffusion to be dominant. So we get this kind of density expectation. Uh, as you go up in altitude, uh, recombination rates start to decrease, uh, as do, of course, the uh, production rates. But this is the typical characteristic. And then you go higher up, there's almost no uh, recombination. And plasma uh, forms a diffusive profile with gravity being the other force and thermal pressure, if you like. So diffusive equilibrium. And the combination, uh, all of our big codes, if you like, that are calculating from first principle physics uh, have these kind of processes as the inherent processes that you need temperature, species densities, and then the production and loss rates. But this is basically how, in a simple way, you can visualize that nose uh, of the uh, uh, F region. OK, uh, Dana put this plot up, and he showed you a very nice version of it. Uh, this is a fairly ugly Xerox copy from Stan Solomon's paper in uh, book three. But again, uh, very quickly, although O plus is the ion that we see in the F region, and the molecular ions are the ones lower down. N2 plus is always a minor ion because it very rapidly interacts with things like electrons, uh, atomic oxygen, O2, to produce uh, other uh, ions. But the uh, bottom line is, here's your kind of source production mechanism for O, the atomic oxygen that's very prevalent up in the upper atmosphere. But this is a very, I use the word simplified, uh, Descri chemical description. In actual fact, it's quite a bit more complicated, including uh, for things like N2+. The lifetime of these states depends on the, 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 the energization level, uh, what kind of uh, energization the, the vibrating uh, molecule has. It's, uh, it determines its kind of lifetime, if you like. OK, um, so here is a kind of key component of this. Our reaction rates between specific species, constant values. So, if, so we have our reaction rate here between N2 plus O2 to produce O2 plus. So what's your background in chemistry knowledge? What might, the, what might cause this not to be a constant? Temperature. And that, to be honest, is the main one that uh, ionospheric modeling uh, depends upon. As uh, auroral electrons come in, or a solar flare comes in, a uh, dual heating is going on, that the neutral temperature uh, goes up, but so does uh, the electron temperature. And many uh, of these reactions uh, depend on temperature, and very nonlinearly, so that uh, some really extreme things happen in our kind of normal atmosphere, ionosphere system. OK, just to wrap up this uh, quick overlook, Mars also has an ionosphere. So all of the physics uh, and chemistry we talked about applies, except, of course, we have additional CO2 uh, kind of molecules you have to include. And the importance of N2 is re reduced significantly. But uh, from both observation and modeling, uh, we can definitely see, and it's not at all intuitive, CO2 plus is kind of a minor ion, uh, whereas O2 plus is the dominant ion on Mars. And uh, even at high altitudes, it's still pretty much there. O plus, uh, again, is created in Mars atmosphere, but it, it's not uh, in our kind of normal altitude ranges uh, a, a key player. It's uh, a molecular ion, O2 plus. So the layer, again, where the peak density is, uh, is down here for Venus. We get a very similar thing. Uh, the uh, Pioneer Venus probes uh, from more than a couple decades ago, again, identified, if you like, an O2 plus primary peak uh, molecular, uh, uh, molecular ions, uh, the O2 ones. And then, uh, in Venus's case, the upper, if you like, the upper uh, ionosphere is O plus ion rich. Um, so everything we just did uh, for the Earth the same codes can be used. Uh, the, the rate coefficients are known. You can uh, simulate these by changing the atmosphere and the reaction rate species. 
So photoionization is the next thing. And Dana did a really good job of talking about photoionization. So we'll see if we can move through it fairly quickly. The EUV irradiance, uh, as we saw the solar cycle dependence, it comes from the solar EUV. Uh, only recently has the short wavelength component become routinely observable. And we're still working uh, with our, our, our solar observers to get this thing uh, done you know, properly. And by that, we're talking about below 10 nanometers, uh, that's soft X-ray. Um, the one thing we found over the years, that using proxy uh, indices, it's not very satisfactory. Does anybody know which proxy index we typically have used for years to represent the sun in this kind of part of the spectrum? Pardon? Yeah, the solar radio flux. Why do we use, or why have we always used the solar radio flux rather than the EUV? We measure, can you measure EUV from the ground? No, you can measure uh, radio. Uh, is the radio uh, photon of comparable energy to the EUV? No, it's orders and orders of magnitude different. But nonetheless, it's out on the tail of your black body, and its physics is governed by processes that are not identical, but are regarded as happening at the same time as the EUV. So when the radio flux goes up and down, and we have various radio uh, phenomena, the expectation has been that you get a good correlation back to this. But it's not ideal. We need to have satellite measurements. And, and there are actually some very good ones. And I believe this afternoon, uh, Nick is going to take you through a lab in which you will see some timed uh, C spectra that cover the EUV uh, range. OK, uh, and of course, the SDO, more recent one. SDO is more famous for its imagery. Uh, but it also has an instrument called EVE which is a, a radiance uh, measurement with uh, good spectral resolution. OK, this, uh, I hope you can't read it, because there's no intention for you to read it. Basically, the computer models contain all these boxes. And they all interact with each other. So the system gets complicated very quickly. But there's a, just a couple key points that we'll bring up. Uh, the first one is. The uh, spectrum typically is from 10 nanometers to 120 nanometers. And that's pretty much at the, at the short wavelength end outside what you might call the black body uh, solar constant that we've heard about. Then uh, during disturbed times, uh, the soft x-rays, the 1 to 10 nanometers, are pretty special because they, their, energy, uh, their, their irradiance, if you like, irradiance, uh, increases by three orders of magnitude during an X-class flare. Uh, the increases over here may be factors of two or three. So uh, this uh, becomes significantly more important during space weather events. Under normal solar cycle variability, this is the spectral range you want to be uh, concerned about or worry about. Uh, NO and CO2 are very effective IR radiators that cool the upper atmosphere. So although this is bringing energy in uh, and causing the thermosphere to have a particular solar cycle dependence, if we have more NO or more CO2 brought up to the, uh, in the atmosphere, they will, and we'll talk more about this in the, this afternoon, uh, you know, how effective these are in cooling the upper atmosphere. Uh, the greenhouse effects lower down have a quite different dependence on uh, these kind of gases. But once they get high up and their uh, infrared radiation is free to escape from the terrestrial environment, they cool uh, the upper atmosphere. And we'll show stuff this later. OK, this is a memory test. It's the, probably the simplest diagram you've seen. Does someone want to volunteer and tell me what you're looking at? Go ahead. Yes? What's the? No, it's not, not the polarization. What, what's this angle all about? Uh -huh. when, when do you get the largest uh, ionization? When the sun's directly above you, OK? Yeah, and so summer, winter, uh, solar, uh, 
during the, during the uh, seasons. Uh, this, and and the, the mathematics led to this wicked set of exponentials. All right, so you get an exponential from an exponential, and you integrate it all up, right? And that's all very wicked, according to the solar people, right? I, I can't say that, but Sidney Chapman is responsible for at least providing a description of that. And if you uh, then use that angle, here's your angle, uh, from zero degrees when the sun is directly overhead versus uh, getting up towards the terminator, what you find is, of course, uh, the ionization. Uh, that's what this thing here is, the relative production rate. And it, this is a, a relative plot. So everything's normalized, so it's not too interesting. Other than the fact, the difference between uh, zero and these other angles is quite significant. Plus, the, alt the relative altitude at which the ionization occurred changes. So the sunlight isn't just a single number or one profile. It depends where you are on the Earth at any given time. So for example, because of our seasons, if you're in the middle of the polar cap, in summer in the northern hemisphere, one's normally thinking you're in darkness uh, if you're at the poles. But during a, a, a summer, June, July, it's completely sunlit all night long. So there is a photoionization going on in the northern hemisphere. What's happening in the southern hemisphere? It's dark. So the magnetosphere has this phenomenal asymmetry in uh, the conductivities that's available to it through uh, field lines mapping into the upper atmosphere. Again, uh, we have uh, temperatures. Uh, there's three temperatures identified. Uh, th this first one is what you'd call local noon. Uh, it's at a location, it's Millstone Hill in Massachusetts beside Boston. Uh, so it's a mid-latitude, high mid-latitude location. And the other panel is in the middle of the night. The thing I want to just point out is one more time. The neutral temperature at some point goes constant. And this is referred to as the exospheric temperature. And uh, the uh, temperature between day and night uh, changes a little bit, but it's not huge. But the more important thing in sunlight, uh, the uh, generation of uh, photoionization and photoelectrons, there's a huge reservoir of energy that the electron gas can tap into, if you like. So the electron temperatures are always much higher and the word photoelectrons. So these soft X-rays have a few hundred EV to a thousand EV. Typically 35 EV is required to produce an ion uh, electron pair, so that when you have a few hundred EV, that photoelectron is uh, creating many ionizations, but also got excess energy that the thermal gas now has. So. Uh, during the daytime, it's easy to explain this uh, from photoelectron heating. And of course, the ions couple to both the neutrals and to the electrons and pick up a slight amount of heating fr uh, from the electrons. At night, you'd say, well, where did that come from? And uh, I just have a quick, what does exospheric temperature refer to? Sorry, I just told you the answer. Does anybody remember exospheric temperature? Come on, quick. Thank you very much. Give the lady a prize. Thank you for listening. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the exospheric temperature uh, in these plots. It's this vertical straight line. And observed, it's observed to be pretty much like that. Uh, so that takes care of that. At night, what causes uh, the electron temperature still to be kind of warm or warmer than the neutrals? Why haven't they all thermalized back to neutrals at night? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we're still, we like to think we're collision dominated because we use transport equations. Uh, technically, you're starting to become correct. But this uh, electron uh, gas, it's connected to where? The magnetosphere. And what kind of energies do you have in the magnetosphere? Much higher energies. And there is still a thermal coupling that's very efficient, yeah. Okay. If the planet had no significant magnetic field, uh, hence the void of a magnetosphere, the atmosphere with photoionization is all the physics needed to generate the ionosphere, and then we'd be done. But, fortunately, but we are on Earth, are lucky and have a magnetosphere, hence we get even more physics to complicate our ionosphere. So that's kind of 
the difference between what we've talked about up until now, you can apply to planets with no um, magnetic fields or no significant magnetic fields. But now we're going to talk about some other effects. Uh, So I'm, this is kind of slightly in the middle. So this is a good time to take a break. So what we've done is the first half, which is uh, a planet with a, only an atmosphere. And let's then uh, pick up in a few minutes, and we'll get down into what then happens if you also have a magnetosphere, aurora, electric fields, and other things. Yeah. I don't need a break, but you guys need a break, right? <laughs>